My name is Ching Ju. I'm a musician, but I'm also a filmmaker. So today I'm very, very excited to have my special guest, Kevin Coons. He is a filmmaker. He is a director, producer, writer, and very much uh, does everything himself. Okay, here we go. Hi, hey. Kevin. Thank How you very you? much for having me. Yes, yes. So, you know, I, I hear this uh, echo again is because I was watching your film earlier. So you cannot have another uh, YouTube channel open, I guess, or for that reason. So we have echo. Yeah. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for watching my film. Yeah, we'll plug it right now. It's available on YouTube, Mobilize, and it's all about cell phone radiation and long-term yes. health effects. And I'm a big yes, cell phone yes. advocate. You know, I got the latest and greatest, but uh, I also yeah. read in the manual and fine print, Tim Cook is telling me not to use it next to my brain and my body. So I wonder what that's about. And you can find out by clicking on the link and checking that movie out. We put it out for free on YouTube and we finished it in 2014 and we're doing a second documentary right now. I heard this thing about, uh, you know, not, you're not supposed to put your cell phone next to your ear. That's like a few years ago. Maybe your film, I already kind of getting exposed about your film. But then I kind of forgot about it, you know? Like lately, there, there wasn't enough uh, message about this, right? So I'm so glad I saw your film and just like refresh my memory of this issue. So tell us a little bit, like 2014, you published this that means you started 2012 and 13 when did you start to make this project and how did how did you decide to do this yeah i started this in 2010 i was at the university of san francisco finishing up my degree and uh i was in a class that basically do a do a video or film for nonprofit. so i wrote on facebook i want to do a free video or film for a nonprofit organization. I got lots of comments from different people. Some writing me private messages saying, hey, I'll pay you, you know, don't tell your college professor. But I got one message in particular that was very interesting. And it was from a uh, college friend, a uh, friend of a friend on Facebook, who said me and my mom started the California Brain Tumor Association after my dad got a brain tumor from using his cell phone for 20 years. And I said, this is really interesting. I want to learn more about this. And I started to interview them. And what I realized is that I had something that was longer than a ju just a couple minutes. I had something that would be feature length because it was such a complicated issue. And there are so many different people who are influential who have spoken on this and have opinions on it. And because there are lobbyists and industry folks trying to prevent you from getting this information. It made it even more alluring to me as a, a young guy and a filmmaker. So here we are almost 10 years later and I am rebooting it. I am looking at my catalog of footage and starting to interview a lot of other new people because there's been more and more evidence and research coming out pointing in the direction of safety and prevention. So that's where we're at right now with it. And uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me on to talk about this. Yes, yes. I think it's a very important issue and uh, this affects a lot of people and, you know, health wise. And uh, unfortunately, um, not a lot of people are aware of this, you know, including my family member. I, I still see them holding the phone right, like this. And uh, but a lot of young people actually use headphones, right? Especially use like uh, Apple or some other brand. Uh, what do you call it? wireless? Uh, wireless um, headphones. So what about wireless headphones? Are they are they um, free? Yeah, you don't want to be using those wireless headphones. You want to use a wired headset. They tell you in the fine print, use the wired headset to reduce exposure. So anytime you see people with those like white Apple earbuds in, it's just, you know, it reminds me of like a cigarette. People are doing it to look cool and they have no idea what's going on. They're completely unaware of this. And it's because when cities like San Francisco and Berkeley want to take the fine print information and put it on the box and bigger print, 
they sue the city saying it goes against your freedom of speech as a corporation. And it's really weird how they're bending the law like this to get what they want. But basically, you know, this is big business and government. And, uh, you know, it's a tale as old as time. And so we are uh, looking at this issue through the lens of uh, political activists, victims, plaintiffs in the lawsuit, um, scientific experts, researchers. Uh, one person we interviewed uh, worked for NIH. Um, so again, these are people who have extreme expertise and are credentialed, like they got Wikipedia's, you know? Uh, so basically I think it has only taken on greater credence uh, since 2014. And it's really interesting just following the lawsuits, following the science, following the journalism. And so we're talking with all the best people about this and uh, hopefully going to have a really compelling story to tell people. And it might be something that's longer than a feature length film. It might be a series. Mm. So that's what we're kind of looking at right now. What you don't really want to put out a three hour movie nowadays, unless you're Martin Scorsese. And even that's going to be difficult in the box office, you know, right. but maybe they're hoping people go back twice in the theater because they went out to use the bathroom or something. Uh, you know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> film theater is not thrilled about a program, such a long thing. They, they could program, you know, two, two films. Right. Uh, and then they can make some money. Double their so, money. Yeah. yeah. So it, shall we, um, shall we watch the trailer? Cause I had yeah, a, you want to watch the trailer? Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let me, let me set. Uh, this screen share trailer okay all right great you see it right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay but it turns out that my cell phone may be a hazard to me because the world health organization is now warning that cell phone use is quote possibly carcinogenic to humans there's a handful of studies that have looked at 10 years or more of cell phone use these studies all find roughly a doubling of the risk of brain tumors on the side on which people say they had been using their phone. Well, once the ordinance was passed and the regulations were developed, we got slapped with a lawsuit by the telecom industry. The CTIA is the name of the organization that represents cell phone manufacturers and service providers. They buy silence. They buy apathy. They buy politicians. The brain of a child absorbs twice as much radiation as an adult. That's a stunning fact. Few people are aware of it. And we are marketing phones and pushing advertising with E-Trade babies talking into cell phones and children running businesses with little phones as though they're benign devices. I would hold my cell phone here and the tumor was right there. The very cell phone companies that are selling us cell phones and telling us that they're safe are at the same time telling us we should hold them an inch from our head, um, uh, we should wonder what, what exactly does that mean. We're beginning to see some evidence coming through in, in the tumor registry data. I think we will see increasing evidence over time. The country, Israel, for example, has, has already shown substantial increases in parotid gland tumors in their tumor registry data. I always held it on my right side, right here. The industry should have put these warnings on they told us a long time ago. Stories that are critical of cell phones aren't being put on the front page because they'd be going next to a sprint ad. It was as if the story had been blacked out. Maybe we're wrong, but maybe we're right. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's um, it's pretty amazing. Like, how would you get all these people agree? Like, how much research you did? Like, how? Like, like where did you start with like uh, these MDs? Yeah, I mean, you you start emailing and you ask, hey, I think you would be good to interview for this. Often, it's somebody who's already spoken on it in another context in a article or something of that nature on the news. And so you find people who can speak on it or people who have done the research. If a new article comes out or new scientific paper, you, you email them. 
And, um, you know, that's kind of how it works. But the hard part is getting to influential people like actors and activists um, because they are often behind, you know, a gated community that says, hey, you know, whoever it may be, you want to star in this movie uh, that's going to come out on Apple TV, don't you? Well, maybe you shouldn't say bad things about the cell phone industry. Oh, you want to do that HBO series? That's AT&T owns HBO. You, you maybe shouldn't be saying anything bad about telecom and about cell phone radiation. But I think we're all kind of becoming aware of the fact that cell phones have a positive effect on our lives. They help us with filmmaking. I've even used my movie to film part of the interviews. I'm saying I'll get another camera angle with this 4K, amazing iPhone quality. You know, like it's pretty great what you can get out of your cell phone now. And so I'm all for cell phones. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But I think that people should just be given this information and be able to make that decision for themselves, whether they want to hold a phone next to their head, which A, if the tower is over here, it needs to go through my head to get there. And so A, there's the radiation going to your brain aspect. Two, wouldn't your phone work better if you use speakerphone and then the signals going around you versus through the matter of your brain? Mm. Um, and then, you know, basically it's just up to people to decide once they have that information. But really, I think people should be thinking about their health and safety mm. because it's a great tool but also I think there is this downside to it because it is radiation. We know that it heats up. We know that there is exposure happening. And so people need to be aware of this and precautious. Right. And that the government and industry have been very deceptive and have not been entirely honest with this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that they care about it for themselves and their family members. Yeah. Um, we have articles and news that talks about Steve Jobs and President Obama. Yeah. They were low tech parents. They wouldn't let their kids use cell phones or iPads until yeah. they were of age. But they also don't want to shout that out loud because they know a lot of parents are buying their kids iPhones. Right, right. You're against the big giant corporations. Um, you know, uh, it, you're affecting their uh, income, their growth, right? So, so it's a up battle, but but I I, uh, I appreciate um, the research, um, yeah, and you you are saving lives, you know. So, yeah. So tell us a little bit. Uh, I want to say hello to Lewis is here. Uh, these are our uh, supporters from Clubhouse, and Mark is here. Shockfin's name is Mark. So um, I don't know if you met uh, Shockfin or Lewis. Have you? I think maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so tell me a little bit um, your background. Uh, you live in San, San Francisco area now. Mm -hmm. uh, you were born in uh, uh, East Coast. Yeah. So I'm originally from Connecticut and uh, grew up there. And I got involved with filmmaking when I was very young. Picked up my uh, dad's, you know, VHS camera, SVHS, if you know that one, uh, and basically, you know, took that from the va family vacation tool to like, I'm going to use this like to tell movies and every day use it. And um, gradually from there got more and more experience, you know, and like we were saying earlier before this, you come from an era when you had tape and you get into digital, the second you realize you got digital, you're like, oh my God, did I, did I just discover gold? You know, like, does no one else realize we don't need to buy tapes anymore? Like I could film a whole movie as many takes as I want because I have digital I could just download it right. um, you know it really opened a whole new door but back when I was starting out up until like college pretty much it was all tapes yeah um, and so some of the first films I did you'd have it on tape and you would digitize it and you'd edit on your computer and I was always the first big technology person like I had a Mac laptop in high school I would take it around and do editing at friend's house and be able to show edits. And that's how I would do it. And I got final cut. I was editing frame by frame doing animation. And I actually got a short animated film into uh, the international children's film festival in New York city. Wow. And um, 
we premiered at the DGA Theater in New York, which is crazy cool as a kid going there. Mm. They put it on T-shirts for the film festival. Mm. It was like a glow-in-the-dark T-shirt. And nice. uh, it was like an Academy Award qualifying festival. So there are movies in there that went on to be the best animated short film that year. It was really inspiring. And they bought the film too. The people who ran the film festival started this small little animation company, distribution company at the time called G kids. And they bought it for like $500, which was like a lot of money back in like, you know, 2005 or whatever. Mm. And now G kids puts out all the Miyazaki films. They're the distributor for every Miyazaki, um, which my daughter loves and I love. And I'm like completely like, that's the only animated thing I ever did. And it's like, in the same distribution you know platform and they of course have never put it out anywhere really i mean they put it on like a dvd i think and they were trying at the time to do like a youtube sort of thing like their version of youtube but spun off for more uh higher level stuff which kind of is what vimeo is now right but um it was really awesome to have that experience as it you know, like little kids coming up to me being like, can I have your autograph? And I'm just like in high school, like, oh, my God, I'm like, I made it. I'm a filmmaker. <laughs> and, um, and then so from your, your um, you, we were talking about yesterday in our room, right? Um, last night's uh, Clubhouse talk about film. Like, what do you like? Like, tell us why you do what you do. Like, what was the first thing attract you to to fiddle around with a camera. Oh, I wanted to tell a story. I wanted to, you know, be able to communicate something to people because sometimes it's better than trying to talk it out. Like you get jumbled in your words. Even if you have the speech written out, you can't get it perfect. And when you edit a movie, you can get it perfect. And you put the music, time it perfect. And then you create an emotion. And all of a sudden you communicate to somebody through their heart and their brain and it's just better than sometimes just talking out with somebody an idea mm -hmm. and i think one of the first movies i did was like we were trying to emulate that movie scream like that mm -hmm. came out i think that was 1999 and uh we were doing a movie like this and it was on a svhs tape and we were like you know little kids playing around and i was walking home and the tape broke i dropped it on the ground and it all spun out and i was like <laughs> oh my god and we went back the next day and reshot it and it was better because we had the experience of before knowing. And so that's always kind of the approach. Sometimes you get something that works and sometimes you look at it in the editing room and you figure out what you need to tweak to make it work. And you could always go back and do that. And that's what makes it this great, you know, tool. Also for me, it was better than being a photographer, or being a writer because you work with other people. And that's always an important part of it is that it's an art form that is communal. And so it's fun to experience it. When you see a film, you often will go to a movie theater for the premiere and everything, and you get to experience it with a lot of other people. And so for me, it's kind of like that idea that you can communicate the perfect sentence to a thousand people all in one, you know, hour shot, one, one, one fell swoop. That was really cool to me that people can go into a movie theater thinking one way about something come out completely different. And I think it has major impacts for society. You, you can inspire other countries to do things like since the documentary came out, the mobilize, uh, six Italian courts have ruled cell phone radiation causes brain tumors. And this is something we're covering in the new film. But when I spoke with the lawyer who litigated the cases, on, on behalf of plaintiffs, he told me he's got mobilized a DVD on his on his desk. I said, wow, I inspired the lawyer who did all these cases, you know, like this little movie I was doing in a tiny one bedroom or studio apartment, I think when I started, uh, inspired other countries to pass legislation. This is the power of filmmaking and storytelling. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah, I was going to say, like, if you get any, you know, result from people watching your film and you know to get inspiration or or solving uh some issues right or winning lawsuit and stuff like that yeah mm -hmm. but that, that's awesome and now um you so what what happened from uh kinetic then you moved to uh san francisco area is it because working 
brought you there or what? So I applied to college and, and decided to go to University of San Francisco and uh, yeah, pretty much put my, my flag in here and my stake in and, um, you know, got to experience the film community in San Francisco and learn about everything. And you go to the Castro Theater and you see these amazing filmmakers there. Like I've seen Martin Scorsese, I've seen Spike Lee, and it was amazing when I finally got to show a movie there mobilize it was like oh my god we finally made it we we showed it at the biggest theater in san francisco what can be better than this mm. and uh the better thing now is netflix right it's getting out on all the platforms all at once to everyone in the world and that's i think the real you know like when you have that type of impact and this is also why i became very passionate about youtube because when you go on youtube like you have a theater that is bigger than the Castro, right? So I might show the movie in the Castro and it's 1,500 seats, but I can show the movie on YouTube and get 30,000 people who watch it in one night. That's the power of YouTube. Yeah, that, that's true. So you decide to put your mobilize on YouTube for a month. Uh, it, and it became longer than that. Now it's, we're, we're like, let's just make it the whole year. I own the copyright. Mine as well, you know. Where else it's it's on? Well, you can also buy a DVD. I love physical media. I'll show you yeah. a movie I just bought recently uh, on physical media. Oh. Godfather. Oh, Godfather, yeah. And again, it's like the reason to own these is you never know what will end up happening later. Someone right. wants to remove it off of Amazon Prime or whatnot. Right edit part of it, censor it, who knows? So you own physical media and then you you own a stake in it. And so I is, is your DVD here if you want to see it. Is your film? So about it. Might as well have the physical media right here. Okay. That's unopened. Fine. Very nice with the plastic wrap. Yeah. So you sell it uh on where? What platform? On Amazon. Anyone who has Amazon can get this. It's also available streaming on Amazon. I think there's like a free trial for the channel that you can subscribe to to get to it. But it's available free on YouTube right now. So if you're watching this in the years 2023, you can watch this and share it with your friends for free on YouTube. Probably the best platform to watch it. And um, feel free to do so. Write a comment hit the like button on it. Or if you have questions, write me a question, you know, timestamp something that you saw was interesting. But uh, we put a lot of energy and effort into it, about four years of work in total. And this next film is now going to be even more time that we are spending. So again, the idea is you make something better. The quality gets better as time goes on because of technology. So I... Uh, I see you interview these people, and so you must have, you had an assistant with you when you made that. No, I made it completely by myself. I had producers who, you know, had no film experience, but had science knowledge or had a uh, background on the issue. And, um, but I was pretty much like completely on my own in the woods with it. So you just put a tripod there and then went up to talk to them. Yeah. Like, yeah, because, you know, you're not, uh, you cannot do selfie, you know? Yeah. yeah, no, I think on a couple of different instances, like maybe one or two days, I had somebody else with me. Um, mm -hmm. We went to the cell phone lobbyist conference. Mm -hmm. I brought my friend Dennis with me. Yeah. Both of his parents are lawyers. And the reason I brought him partially was if we got in any trouble or arrested or anything at the conference, we would have his lawyer parents be able to bail us out. Yeah. Well, so was that experience like, do people like say, hey, go away? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, we went to the cell phone lobbyist conference that they pulled from San Francisco after they passed the safety bill and they moved it to San Diego. And I went there with the cell phone manual, the fine print blown up on a piece of paper and showing people, hey, this is what's in your manual. Why, why, why is this organization uh, suing the city of San Francisco just for putting this that's in the manual on the box? And a lot of people in the industry were not aware of this. So I think it speaks to, you know, you don't need to get everyone involved in your company. You just have a couple people on the top who are kind of aware who, you know, don't say anything to the people down below. And I think we've seen this uh, repeatedly with the telecom industry because a lot of the lawsuits that have happened have actually been 
from people who worked for telecom who developed brain tumors from using their cell phone during testing or otherwise. And so this is the case with Motorola, Murray versus Motorola, which is an ongoing lawsuit that dates back to 2001. And uh, now there are many plaintiffs, <coughs> many people who have used their phone, not just people who work in the cell phone industry. But it's interesting that it started from actual workers in telecom who are aware of this issue only to a certain extent. I was also uh, told by my friend that do not put your phone next to your pillow and try not to actually bring your phone into your bedroom. Is that Does that have any merit? Yeah, I mean, if you're spending a third of your life sleeping roughly and you keep your cell phone this far away when you're asleep, then that's not really good because you still have it connected to the network. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's smart to turn off your phone at night. Maybe you get an emergency call or you have like an earthquake alert or something. So I keep my phone on, but I keep it away from my bedside as far away as I can get. And I plug it in somewhere and it charges, but it's certainly not close to my head. And so again, it's all about that exposure and the distance. Mm -hmm. Just a little distance away, talking on speakerphone like this is mm -hmm. a lot versus holding it there because of this thing called the inverse square law, which mm -hmm. basically, if you can imagine a pyramid coming out, it's like infinitely less radiation. So that's why they say, keep it just a couple millimeters away from your body. And mm -hmm. you read that in the manual and you think, well, what does this really matter? Mm -hmm. But actually it matters quite a lot when it's your brain that's right next to it or your salivary gland, primary yeah. gland, you know. So it's very interesting. Um, and a different note, um, you, uh, you are also into uh, uh, VR, right? Mm -hmm. so yes, tell yes. Us, so tell us a little bit about your experience. Um, you, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's a, uh, what do you call that? Back when they were called Oculus, this is an Oculus Go headset. Oh. And, uh, yeah, I put the, the eyes on there and you got a little, you know, you can basically watch a movie on there. And what was nice about this one is you could download it locally. You oh. connect it to your computer with a micro USB, really easy cable. You got a headphone. Yeah. And I would bring this on the airplane and stuff and be able to watch stuff. And I'm not connected to Wi-Fi, so I'm doing it safe and I'm able to review movies or watch something else. How big um, is the storage? Um. Like this okay. was pretty small, I think like 128 gigabytes. Oh, okay. So this is something with the new Apple headset. They're talking $3,500 at the Apple Vision Pro, and they haven't even said how much storage. Is it a terabyte? Is it two terabytes? And the idea that how do you get local footage on there? Their whole thing is talking about, you know, being able to film with the headset. Mm -hmm. I think that's a horrible idea. You know, we don't we don't have like recording glasses really because our heads bounce around when we're trying to record stuff, which is why mm -hmm. we use a tripod mm -hmm. or we use our hands and our arms, which are mm -hmm. really stable. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that Apple wants people to use their head as the camera is kind of ridiculous. Um, I don't think it's really going to work, uh, but it is mixed reality. It's volumetric. You'll be able to look around, but I think they should have made something more for VR 180, which is like you can use your cell phone here these two mm -hmm. and if i could take my iphone and record something and then send this to the headset plug them in or something and send it really easily that i think would have utility that might be worth two thousand dollars or something mm -hmm. but uh at three thousand five hundred it's really <laughs> ridiculous and we know from leaks that the cost of the product is actually more around a thousand five hundred so they're really just yanking you, your your wallet trying to get into your purse that extra coin and i don't think many people are going to use it i think it's going to be very low sales but they'll make a second version that will maybe be smaller and they're going to keep upgrading it and learning from it but ultimately i think they didn't learn anything from the 10 years that vr has been in the marketplace with devices like this and people like myself filming things professionally in this medium um, I love this medium. I think it's great. And I think this proves how much of a non-Luddite I am for all those people who are like cell phone radiation. I don't know about this guy. I love technology. I love, you know, using these cameras to be able to tell these immersive stories. Yeah. But I think, again, there's a safe way to use it and an unsafe way. It's right. It's kind of like a car without a seatbelt or airbags. And 
this was the car industry, the auto industry for a long time. And it took people like Ralph Nader going out there and being like, yeah, but my friend died in a car accident. You could have, you know, made cars safer because their, their lineage at the time, the car company was, it's just unsafe drivers. So mm -hmm. if you get T-boned in a car accident, it's your fault. No, it's the other driver. You could have made a safer car, but the car industry didn't want to do that until lawsuits happened. Right. Mm -hmm. And now what is the best selling car? The safest car on the market. <laughs> So mm -hmm. the car that has the most safety features costs the most money, right? So these are the interesting factors of how, you know, public consensus can change. Right. Um, let's see. I hope I'm not getting any feedback because earlier um, I uh, think I had your uh, YouTube channel. So I am looking at YouTube channel. You have a, a quite, quite handsome uh, channel. Let me know, let me go and show people. So, um, do you have any? When you you talk about VR, do you have any uh, work here that you can show us? Um, yeah, you know, there's a number yeah. of different things. I would say uh, the latest film reel is pretty much the best thing. If you go, yeah, the videos. It is. Let me go down a little bit more. I post often. Keep going. Keep going. Oh. A little bit more you'll see 50 cent there that's who you want to click on right 50 on the cent? yep the wrapper hold on right on the left nope oh, you're going down oh, this yeah oh, it is yep oh okay so what you do you I, it's a real a portfolio of like pretty much 20 years of work and I, it came out pretty good i think oh my god this one yep so cool yeah so like you know 20 years of different stuff in there pretty much 20 years you you look like 19 or so i always hey there, internet hope you're having an amazing tuesday that was May actually third i am ago. talking with you today a little bit oh, about okay. why <laughs> sorry right so yeah so so um so this is a a real to show your work in commercial in 
uh, different events, right? So how 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 do you do that? Like you have to gather all these footage you shot and put them together, right? Yep. So I basically took, you know, um, as much of the raw that I could find of it. Sometimes it was just already edited stuff that I had to work from. And uh, you often don't want to do that because like a copy of a copy is never as good as the original. Right. But uh, basically, you know, I wanted to find what are the main things that people would recognize in the beginning. You have recognizable people. That's a win. You have a recognizable song and brands. Because uh, we do a lot of commercial work. That's the bread and butter that pays for doing social impact work, right? right, right. And everyone has this. You do your, your work so you have your passion project, right? right. And uh, basically, you know, we have been blessed to work with a lot of great clients. And I wanted to show that off to the world and uh, make something really fun and exciting. And so that was the idea. And uh, I did a first pass of it. And it's always evolving. Like you kind of know each year as you do it, you know, you try and make one every year, but you can't do that. Maybe you do it every couple of years or you, you do it when you have a significant amount of new projects. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of stuff from VR. That's what I had done the past couple of years. So I want to make this one really focused on my standard film work with regular DSLR cameras or iPhones, things of that nature, um, drone footage, anything basically I said could fit in here but I didn't want it to just be VR focused. So um, working under that, I felt, okay, what if I break it up into these different sections of different genres of stuff that we do? And um, that's kind of, you know, you create rules and you do that as a way to create a project, a story in the short format. And then your brain starts to process the rule. Okay, there's text here. This I'm following a story at least. If you didn't have the text, you might be less interested to want to watch it all the way through. So it's a way to hook people in there. You have the people, but then also you have an ongoing story. Like, where's this leading, you know? Whose music is this? I think uh, this piece uh, has a lot to do with um, the, the audio is so good. Oh, yeah. This is from White Lotus is where I first heard the song, the season two. And um, I found a remixed version of it that goes for longer, the amount of time that I needed. Mm -hmm. And so I said, this is something I'm using as, you know, a resource because I'm mo posting it for public. I'm not monetizing it. And uh, yeah, it's a really great song and hopefully more people will buy that song on iTunes. That's how the system kind of works and why they allow that. And uh, I saw that firsthand. Um, I did a viral video when this movie There Will Be Blood came out and I made a There Will Be Milkshakes. Mm. And all of a sudden I saw on iTunes, Khalees like rising in the charts. And I was like, did I do that? Like the song had already been out for years prior but it had a resurgence because of the YouTube video, which had gotten, you know, mm. 100,000 plus views at the time, which at that point in YouTube's thing was viral. And people were like, oh, my God, we have to write about this in Entertainment Weekly. And I was getting phone calls from Entertainment Weekly in college being like, your YouTube video is pretty popular. Mm. And I think it's really viral when if you're parodying something, it goes full cycle. And it went full cycle and went back to P.T. Anderson and Daniel Day-Lewis. Mm. And Daniel Day Lewis said that in Ireland, where he's from, it's called taking the piss out of it, which is basically like what parody is. So it was like amazing that the thing I edited in an hour on my laptop, yeah, just because my brother was like, wouldn't it be funny if somebody remixed the Khalees song with that scene? And the movie hadn't even come out like digitally. It was just we saw it in the theater. He said that. And I had the trailer and a couple clips on YouTube. I downloaded those and I remixed it with that song. And again, it was like overnight, like, boom, you know? And so I YouTube has this power yeah. um, to communicate and get out there to people. And uh, yeah, it was crazy just, you know, hearing about how people are putting it on like baby diapers and selling them and stuff, you know, like, <laughs> that was a whole nother aspect. So, and, so yeah. when you set up, um, you set up when people go on your YouTube uh, popular videos, you can do that. How do you do that? You see, when I click on your uh, yeah, YouTube, mm -hmm. it's giving popular videos first. But when you see my YouTube, it says video and then says popular. But even if I click on popular, right, and then I go back to watch again, it's still uh, not in a pub, uh, 
Yeah. I'm not sure YouTube created that thing for me. And I just said, oh, yeah, let's put this one at the top versus just yeah. the VR stuff. Let's put the most viewed things because yeah. that's kind of what people are uh, yeah. so alert to at first. I have a question. You yeah. did something 15 years ago. Now is have 695. That's the one I was just talking about. Yeah, there will be milkshakes. <laughs> that's crazy. So let's see. Oh, yeah, no, this is not the good version, by the way. Oh, we, okay, let me explain further. Pause it. So, this is 240. So, 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 so let me explain. Mm. YouTube at the time was in its infancy. This was around 2006, 2007, right? Yeah. And we did a remix. That was original music I had created. Oh. And YouTube said, cease and desist. You would, you have to pull this because Khalees eventually got to a point where she's like, I don't want this song there anymore. I changed my mind about it. I made my money. I'm out, you know? Yeah. And so we actually, you know, like I didn't want any legal action going on and I pulled it and YouTube said, you re we will recommend some songs that you can put over it. Mm -hmm. And so they pulled my original remix yeah. that I made as a DJ original creation. Yeah. And this is why I love Vimeo. I upload the real version on Vimeo. Now, it's funny is a bunch of people copied my thing and did the exact same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like they did their own remix of the song and theirs are all still allowed to be on YouTube, but I can't reinstate mine somehow. Oh. So these are little problems with YouTube that I, you know, I love YouTube, but it has its issues there. And I right. will point that out. Right, right, right. Wow. So you certainly had a lot of views. This is 90 seconds. You got 1.1 million. Yes, yes. What the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could go, that's just even me just talking about the PS5 fan noise and stuff. Oh, okay. I could go on and on about this for quite a while. But okay. ultimately, I want to state that, you know, I appreciate you having me on here. I don't really have a whole lot more else to talk about beyond this. <laughs> but I really appreciate the time and the support. So, oh no, you know. thank you for coming. And um, yeah, I wanted to show people your very popular, uh, quite quite popular on um, you know youtube channel do you do shorts often i i do a lot of shorts i do lots of youtubing you know i try and keep people up to date on anything i learn on youtube mm -hmm. you know even if it relates to your car or baby pigs in bangkok mm -hmm. whatever it may be you know i like to post just the things it's like my diary mm -hmm. and so um that's how I use YouTube. And I think it's a great resource because people can monetize the content that they put out there. Right. But I sadly need to get going. I'm getting an urgent phone call here that I'm, you have just, to go? I'm able to read the transcript. I need to call back right away. Oh, so you have to go right now. I have to go. <laughs> oh, okay. But thank you okay. so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Very welcome. Have so, a great yeah. time. Bye, Bye, Kevin. All right. So, uh, <laughs> You guys, thank you so much for being here with us. And we didn't have time to uh, do a, what do you call, a rapid fire. And um, I guess uh, Kevin is in a emergency phone call. Um, so yeah, so next week, um, next week, uh, let's see, on the 21st, I will be interviewing Antoine Wed. W E N D. He's a French singer, which I just met uh, about three weeks ago in New York City in um, Washington Square Park. And uh, yeah, and um, I'm going to we're going to do a show next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time because he's a French. So we want to reach audience in Europe. So I decided to do a show at 1 p.m. Eastern Time instead of five. Okay, so hopefully you guys can come. Yay. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Shockfin. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Lewis. Um, yeah, to be with us. And that, that was a nice um, insight of a film, young filmmaker's world, how he made his film um, mobilized. So if you guys uh, uh, want to, you can check Mobilize on YouTube and you can watch it. Okay, I'm gonna close this. Um, yeah, so ending the broadcast. Bye now. Thank you.